cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone oh praise the Well, good morning. Uh, the gift of times like this in worship 
being able to hear voices singing together, it's special. And to be able to share in that together is, is wonderful. Uh, I love even just the final, final word of that when we declare amen together. It is this declaration saying that we agree. That the praise that we offer up is something we agree upon together. And it's something that we want to share in. Well, welcome. This is, if this is your first time here at City Collective, we're really glad that you're able to be here with us. My name is Jason. I have the privilege of being the lead pastor here. Uh, we are in the middle of a series as we walk through the Gospel of John. Uh, this Lenten season, there's a lot of different things that you can be thinking about, things that you might be giving up. We went out for, for dinner with, uh, with a couple in the church a couple nights ago, and we got all the way to dessert, and they, we got the dessert menu, and then they looked at it, and then great conviction came upon their heart because they realized they gave up dessert for Lent. So uh, we did not partake in dessert together because we, in solidarity, said no. Uh, Kind of wish we did have dessert because I have a sweet tooth. But uh, different things that you do in Lent for the ways that you participate in your spirituality, participate in your relationship with God, and ask the question, how can we be part of what God is doing in the world together? Because that is such a beautiful invitation that we're constantly given in a culture where so much of what we do is individualistic and it's about doing the best of what we've got and grinding and, and pursuing that, there is a greater invitation that is given to the followers of Jesus, that there is a kingdom at hand in the world. Would you see it and would you taste it of it? Would you participate in it? And would you be part of providing it in a way that so transforms it into the image of Christ that God desires? There's more to the story. So we've, or we're in week three of our series. Week one, we talked about the idea that there's more than meets the eye. If you are joining us for the first week of this or you've missed one week in the meantime, I would highly encourage you. Let's be walking through the Gospel of John together. John 1, John 2, this week is John 3. John 1, this beautiful prologue of, of poetry and rhythm of how God is actually interweaving himself from the very beginning in the world. And then John 2, we see the first sign. It's this first impression that Jesus gives of who he really is and why it matters in what he's doing. And today, uh, we are, like I said, in John chapter 3 and approaching what is perhaps the most famous verse in all the Bible. Go to a football game, a wrestling event. John 3.16 seems to find its way into it to some degree, somewhere, somehow. It is, uh, it is well known, but I don't know if it's fully w well understood. Uh, it, is, it is simple, but it is profound. And it comes in the midst of a context and a situation that I don't know if all of us are fully aware of. Because John chapter 3 is not this dramatic declaration on the top of a hill. It's not Jesus in the middle of a miraculous miracle. It is Jesus in the moment of a conversation. It is Jesus and our buddy, someone we're going to get to know a little bit, Nicodemus. So we're going to read this together. We're going to read a good chunk of scripture, the first 21 verses of John chapter 3. You can follow along on the big screen, and uh, we'll get going here. So it says this. It says, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him. And Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. How can someone be born when they're old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asks. You are Israel's, Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. 
I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. And then we find ourselves in in that verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. It's a pretty deep conversation, wouldn't you say? It's a lot of things that are going on and a lot of, a lot of moments within it that probably captured your attention or caused you to ask a question. Uh, one thing that we recognized early in our marriage is that uh, we have very different eyesight. Uh, I, I don't wear glasses often on Sunday morning, but I actually have really bad eyes, like really bad eyes, like negative six, negative five kind of thing, like verging on the, on, on the scale of like blindness. Uh, and so pray for me. <laughs> I hope, hope it doesn't go, get too much worse. But uh, like I'm, the, I'm the guy that when I have to order glasses, I have to get like the extra bit at the end of it so it's not like a Coke bottle. So I can actually see still while not having these giant lenses sticking out the front of my face. I have really bad eyes, but the place that is most noticeable is in the dark. And uh, Adriana takes particular pleasure in this, that if it is dark outside and, and we're like about to go to sleep or something like that, she will turn off all the lights in that house and I stumble. I'm not even making this up. I stumble through the house. I feel for the walls until my eyes get acclimated while she sits and she laughs at me. And that's marriage, isn't it? <laughs> but you, you, I, I'm stumbling through and I'm trying to find my way so my eyes can like catch up in the moment. My, my eyesight is not particularly good and it's even more so in the dark. The, the, this, this passage that we're looking at in John chapter 3, it's reflective of the story and the foundation that's kind of been laid for us. In the prologue, this metaphor and this, this picture of light and dark is played for us from the very beginning. And it's shown for us in how Jesus even presents his responses in this conversation. You do things in the dark to not be seen, but the reality is, though you might not be seen, you're going to find it hard for yourself to see as well. This story that we are going to jump into, it, it takes place in secret. And it's worth noting that that's the foundational metaphor And what Jesus is trying to do is provide an illumination that takes place in the proverbial darkness that Nicodemus is in. Someone who chooses to come at night with Jesus, and there's a lot of reasons why that might have been taking place, scholars say, for different reasons, but most likely this had something to do with not wanting to be seen by the Jewish ruling council he was very much a part of, the Sanhedrin. Well aware of what Jesus has already done in his ministry. You see that, that's the very first thing he says to him. I know that what, what you've done, and I've known the miracles and the things that have taken place. And he even says, uh, signs have happened. Last week we looked at John chapter 2. We only looked at one of the signs, his very first one. And it does outline a couple more, but we can assume that Jesus has done more in the course of his ministry before Nicodemus has had this conversation. There have been many things that have taken place that have established a reputation that Jesus has assumed. So, so Jesus is known. Nicodemus sees him in a certain way, and he approaches him, and he, and he calls him rabbi. He calls him teacher. And he recognizes the works that have taken place in his ministry. And at the start of this conversation, uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus isn't assumed as a prophet by Nicodemus. 
He's simply thought of as a teacher endowed with God's power. And, and he even uses another plural word in that opening sentence, and he says, we. Not just, I have this question, or I have this thought. He's saying, we, as if he is representing and speaking for a group of people that are also curious about this man who is going around causing all these great things to take place. And Jesus responds... But if you notice, Nicodemus didn't really ask a question at the beginning. Just kind of makes a statement. But there's this underlying implied question that seems to be a place. And it's this, it, is, it is this. I know that this is what you do. This is what I've heard about you. And if this is what is actually taking place, it can only be of God. And if that is the case, who are you really then? We know that you're a teacher from God, but are you more? Are you a prophet? Are you the Messiah? And Jesus doesn't respond to that question in particular, but he responds to the assumption of the question, to the belief system that is undergirding how Nicodemus treats him, how Nicodemus actually has this limited amount of admiration for him. Jesus replies, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. In, in the statement that Nicodemus makes, he says, I know what you have done and Jesus doesn't choose to point at, oh, well, look at all the things I've done. Of course I am who I say I am. And says he, instead, he begins to communicate how, who he is and what he's doing is different than anything that's taking place. You see, my signs are an indicator that I'm connected to God, but that's not actually how you are to experience God in this world. It's not based upon what you do. And Nicodemus asks, answers with a question himself that I think all of us would answer with. Great. How am I supposed to be born again? To re-enter my mother's womb. And you can, I want you to imagine it with a significant sarcastic tone to the statement. This is a teacher of the law. This is someone who would have been well-versed. And I imagine that he responds to this this odd idea of being born again with a little bit of sarcasm in his voice. Are, do you expect me to actually to re-enter my mother's womb? If you've ever grown up in, in Christian circles or spent time in Christian circles, this idea of being born again is, is an interesting one. I think there are associations with the type of people that are being born again. We kind of put people in categories. This is what we do as human beings more often than not to our detriment. And we, we think to ourselves, well, uh, someone that's born again, perhaps they're, they're an emotional type of person. They want that emotional experience, that, 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 that moment for them to grab hold of. They, they can be born again. Or, or we think to ourselves, well, that's someone that has actually experienced a lot of hurts in their life. We would characterize them as perhaps broken. And then we, we say that, well, of course they need to be born again. Drugs have been a part of their life. They need, to, they need to have a refreshing within their life. Being born again is for them. Or we go to the other extreme and we say, well, if they're a really religious person, well, maybe then they can be born again. They've got all the moral structures in place to actually ascend to that idea of who God wants us to be. A, a conservative spiritual, religious person, perhaps being born again is actually for them. And this idea of being born again is, is applied to a specific type of person in many ways. But then we are given this individual of Nicodemus. He's a member of the ruling council, the Sanhedrin. He would have been a really high status figure, a wealthy individual, he wouldn't have been known as perhaps an emotional type or, or even a, a, a characterized as, as broken. He would have been thought of as very much put together. That he, he doesn't need more moral structure in his life. In fact, he's got a lot of it already. But, and he's not even just the, the classic conservative religious type either because he comes to Jesus. 
He comes to Jesus, and Jesus is not one that is looked upon in society or within his circles as someone that they should actually be looking to for teaching or for thought. Jesus wasn't the one that would seem to check all the boxes that a conservative religious type would maybe go to. So suddenly, when we look at all of these characteristics that we might put people into to receive this idea of being born again, Nicodemus doesn't fit any of them. This is one of the most open-minded men you're going to find in the Gospels. He's open to these radical new ideas, and he comes and he speaks to Jesus. Not an emotional type, not, not maybe characterized as broken or needing moral structure, and not this conservative religious uh, individual who has it all put together so he can ascend to that place of actually receiving what God has. He's nothing like all those things. And what does this tell us? It tells us this. It tells us that being born again doesn't mean that you need more morality and religion in your life. In fact, Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, the new birth is a challenge to morality and religion. It's saying that you've got all of the morality and religion in the world, Nicodemus, and you need to be born again. He doesn't say you're an awfully good guy. You're about three quarters of the way there. I'm going to hook you up with a spiritual vitamin supplement that's going to get you to the next level. It's your pre-workout that you need to get there. No, he's saying that you've done a lot of good things, sure, but all of it does not equate to what it means to be born again. This is what Paul writes about in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. He says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. So Jesus responds to Nicodemus. To Nicodemus' is confused slightly sarcastic response. And he says, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Jesus would go on and he would appeal to who Nicodemus is. Uh, If you remember in the text, he references a story including Moses out of the book of Numbers. And this would have been significant for someone like Nicodemus. Nicodemus in his his time, part of the ruling council, probably had Genesis through Deuteronomy memorized. He was very familiar (laughs) with the story that was being presented out of the book of Numbers. And this was, would have been the manner in which he actually received and communicated and, and was a foundation for his relationship with his faith, with his spirituality. I think there's, there's a tension that exists for someone like Nicodemus that's very relevant for how we think in our culture. This was a very astute, knowledgeable individual that was likely approaching his, his conversation with Jesus as a way to fill in the blanks, to, to know more. And th- there's this tension that we often encounter where for us in our modern Western society, knowledge has become everything. And it's almost like the, this form of, of Gnosticism It's this concept that divine knowledge of a supreme being is somehow our way to redemption. That to know it is enough. To know about it is is going to get me to that place of redemption. Whereas what the Bible presents, what the scripture presents, what Jesus presents is not that knowing is doing to know is, is a good thing, but Nicodemus, you got to be born again. It's nice to know all of those ideas and those thoughts, but you need to be born again. 
And, and here's the thing about being born again. It's like the wind. The, the word wind in the Bible is, is associated with spirit. They're one and the same, actually, in the text. And it's this Greek word, pneuma, that, that identifies spirit to be in this analogy of wind. And so when Jesus is talking about the wind comes and goes and it moves and, and it doesn't have anyone controlling it, you can almost substitute this idea of spirit alongside it. But Jesus is saying the spirit comes and it goes and it moves and you need the spirit to actually operate in participating in the kingdom of God. That it is not simply I know what to do and I know how to do it and now I can do it and now I'm successful and now I'm capable and now I'm welcomed into the kingdom of God. In fact, it is surrender. It is understanding that we might not be able to see the wind, but we can see the effects of it. That we might not be able to see the spirit, but we can see the effects of it. Have you encountered someone who has come into contact with Jesus, perhaps for the first time? It is as if the Spirit has been there all along, and now we are seeing the effects of it. That to be born again is to have the Spirit actually do the, the new birthing. That you see the life that comes out of them. This is why story is so powerful and important. This is why your story matters. If you're a follower of Jesus, and if you're truly a follower of Jesus... There is, there is a reality that we have actually come to a revelation of Jesus, not out of our own strength, but by the gift of God. That to, that to know Jesus is actually the spirit at work in our lives, transforming us in such a way that we begin to move and operate and think and react in a way that's beyond our current, and, our current ability and thought. I, I, I love coming into those situations. I've experienced it for myself. Because it's not simply the, the idea of like I, I, was, I was broken and I was, I was falling down and I needed to get back up and, and the Spirit found me. Because there is story like that. But perhaps your story is more along the lines of I, I was raised in a good home. Or I, I, just, I, had, I had the basic necessities of what I need and I was genuinely satisfied but yet I knew that something was missing for myself I, I went through the first 15 to 18 years of my life pretty satisfied with the church that I was a part of with the family that I was in and then I go to university and I have my kind of world rocked all that was identity for myself is taken away you grow up telling everyone that you're going to be a doctor you show up at university and you realize I'm not going to be a doctor one day I should not be doing this because it is perhaps not for me and it rips all of your identity away so quickly, and then you become searching in all these other places for what, what it might be that actually fulfills you. And it doesn't have to be dramatic or, or awful, but, but it, it is away from what God has. And, and I remember just a, a single day of, of coming, to, coming to a church in Calgary, and just having this, this revelation of, I know the answers. I've grown up in, in a good home. I've done good things. Heck, I, I've, I've served in church for a long time. But I don't know if I have ever actually had the Spirit birth something new in me. And when it did happen... It is like life went from black and white to color. It's like reading the Bible became more than a spiritual practice, but actually this, this inherent necessity of myself to know the one that has encountered me, to be born again. It is the wind that we do not see, but we see the impact. So often we are 
lost in this idea of, of this Gnosticism, this belief that knowledge is, is enough. But think of it like this. Uh, I, could, I could read every book out there on how to deal with electrical outputs. I'm not a handy individual. I will tell you that right now. You're forced into that once you have a house. And even then, you're just grateful that you have friends. <laughs> and I could read every single book out there on how to do this with an electrical outlet or how to, how to set this up. But uh, instead, I, I'll, I'm more likely to, to, call, to call Hannes. He's an electrician. So he might know that I've read all the books, but he still probably doesn't trust me to be doing every little detail that he's doing. That the knowledge is one thing, but experience is another. That knowledge is one thing, but to actually have it be part of your being is another. This is what is being established by Jesus in this opening dialogue with Nicodemus. You know it all, but it isn't what you're actually searching for. Mental ascent is not spiritual revelation. It needs to be more. The, the moment of, of the Spirit coming alive, this is significant even within the biblical story. So the, the Old Testament is riddled with, with prophecy and this beautiful story of how God was going to save his people. And the, the story of the time to come that was being presented for the people of Israel to place their hope in was that the Spirit would fall upon them. The Spirit would come from God into the world and would begin to make all things new. This was the future that they were promised. But then in Jesus, we see this actually take place. It's almost like the future came before, <laughs> before us into the present. This, this promised day of, of a time and a place where the world is renewed and redemption is, is shown and seen was, was presented to the Jewish people. And then we see Jesus come in and interrupt and be like, I have come and I'm bringing that into the here and now with the Spirit being poured out upon my people. It was this interruption of the moment. And this is where Christianity kind of gets a little crazy because all of the expectations of the renewal of the world, of this future world to come, they didn't wait till the very end, but they get ushered into history through Jesus. The Spirit came to dwell with humanity. And you can see it in everyone who's born of the Spirit. And then Nicodemus asks, how can this be? His tone has changed a little. He's gone from maybe, like, I know who you are. We're good. To, uh, I'm not really sure who you think you are, but we're not good. And now he's like, I'm not good. I don't know what you just said. How can this be? Maybe Nicodemus had six honorary doctorates, but Jesus said, if you couldn't see something as plain as the nose on his face, He'd better go back to kindergarten. Like he's, he, he's now, he's, th he's throwing down. Jesus isn't really trying to be soft and subtle here. F Frederick Buechner writes it like this, because this is the response that follows. Jesus said, I'm telling you, God's so in love with this world that he sent me down. So if you don't believe your own eyes, then maybe you'll believe mine. Maybe you'll believe me. Maybe you won't come sneaking around scared half to death in the dark anymore, but will come to, come clean, come to life. Jesus' response is that I am the way to life. Looking to me is how you are born again. Why? Because I love you, because I've come to save you, because I've come to overcome the darkness. And that's when it brings us to the most famous verse in the Bible. John 3.16 and like I said, it's not given in this dramatic sermon. And I think this is so beautiful because so much of what we do when we think about Jesus is big and dramatic. And he's casting out demons and he's, he's giving sight to the blind and he's feeding the 5,000 and he's doing the dramatic and he's dying for us on the cross. And there's so much power in his life. Yet the verse that stands out to explain who he is in all of humanity is in a conversation. It's in doubt. It's in the question. 
And it's an invitation. It's, it's, not, it's not a rally cry. It is an invitation. Would you see who I am and what my heart is for you? For God so loved the world that he gave his son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. This is the greatest invitation that could have ever been given. Nicodemus would have been the best of the best. And Jesus speaks to him in a way so that he can understand. He, he quotes a story out of Numbers. He, he references how the Spirit's at work in a way that's beyond simply knowledge. And, and why does this matter? Because Jesus, just like he does with Nicodemus, enters into where we are at and meets us there. He speaks to us in the ways that we need to be spoken to. He meets us in the spaces that we feel so sure. And he provides a better way, a truer way, a, a fuller way so that we might flourish in the life that we've been given. And this is, this is part of what is being a follower of Jesus can be difficult sometimes. I think we think about all the different ways we can be quote-unquote holy. And we, we think about all the practices. And there's some beautiful practices out there. There's a, a Franciscan practice, an Ignatian practice, all of these like well-thought-out, beautiful ways of simplicity or activity or stability. And, and these are gross of oversimplifications, don't get me wrong, of these practices. But in comparison to these different modes of spirituality, what we often fall into is I need to do this in order to develop a relationship with God. And it's helpful to remember very simply that there just isn't one way of being faithful in following Jesus. Because Jesus is the one who is first faithful to, to us. And when we can first catch that, that Christ meets you where you're at, as you are, with your quirks, with your personality, with the way that you learn and the way that you receive, if you have that understanding, suddenly you can do as the Bible say, says and discover the rhythms of grace. Then the mode of your spirituality isn't dependent on practice or perfection, but it's on relationship. And then you can find those rhythms of grace out of relationship. Because that's what a great relationship is, isn't it? You get to know each other. And you fall in love with, with, with someone. And, and you, you want to know more about them. And you've got a way of doing things. This, this, is, this is like marriage 101 of how we talk about. The love languages. You've got to get to know how the other person experiences love. And the great thing is that God experiences love in the whole flourishing of it all. Like we don't have to cater to a specific way in order to get to God. But God understands that we, re we receive and we, we show love in certain ways. And those ways are beautiful to him in every single personality that's in this room. Just because your neighbor seems to have it going on for them, don't simply adopt their practice because you think it works, but ask the question, why does it work for them? Is there relationship there? Are they pursuing something that's true to themselves? It's not about just getting a practice in place. It's about having the relationship that is birthed out of this rhythm of grace that God wants you to have. This is what it is to be born again. To have the Spirit lead you. To be born again by the Spirit and have that rhythm in our life. Because where Jesus always wants to take us in these moments is back to that glorious truth. 
He'll confront us. He'll meet us where we're at. And then he says John 3.16 all over again because it is the greatest promise for us to hold on to. Frederick Bruner, he articulates this verse as the greatest ever. He says, God, the greatest subject ever, so much, the greatest extent ever, loved, the greatest affection ever, the world, the greatest object ever, that he gave his one and only son the greatest gift ever, so that every single individual, whoever, this is the greatest opportunity, who is entrusting himself to him, the greatest commitment, would never be destroyed, the greatest rescue, but would even now have deep, lasting life, the greatest promise. This is what Jesus wants Nicodemus to hear. He almost strips away his pride strips away his, his barriers of knowledge and leads him to this place of, oh, okay, how, what does that even mean? And then he, he provides him with the greatest promise ever that he gives to each of us here today. And here's what's really cool. This isn't the last moment we see Nicodemus in the Bible. This is the famous story that we hear about. But in John 7, 50, we find him in the temple courts and his posture's changed a little. He's actually defending Jesus to the Sanhedrin. Nicodemus got something, hap something happened to him that night. The spirit started moving in him just a little bit. And then we find him in John 19, 38 to 39. And we'll put this one up on the screen. This is after the crucifixion. And it says, later Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away, and he was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. The man who came at night had actually seen the light. And he could not deny it. I imagine that there was probably some remorse within Nicodemus. Feeling as if he'd, he'd missed, his, missed his moment. That, that the revelation was shown right to him and he still didn't fully grab hold of it. Even the idea of 70 pounds, 75 pounds of spices and, and myrrh and aloe being used. Uh, back in that time, it was about one pound that was used in most burial scenarios. This was, this was a rich man's proof of devotion in many ways. Possibly remorse for timidity that he felt. That perhaps felt irredeemable. His time had passed, come and gone. You missed your mark. That's how he felt. And he probably felt like his courage had come too late. But here's the beautiful thing. Jesus was not dependent on Nicodemus' courage in order to bring salvation. Jesus was not dependent on Nicodemus' understanding in order to give the promise. Jesus was not dependent on Nicodemus grabbing hold of the freely given gift that was in front of him in order for him to continue to pursue him. Because we don't, see, we don't hear of any more interactions, and perhaps there were. Nicodemus might have come to Jesus that night, but Jesus was always pursuing Nicodemus. He pursued, pursued him all the way to the cross. And then even when Nicodemus felt like his courage had come too late, he was still being pursued by Jesus because none of it was dependent on Nicodemus. The gift and promise he spoke of in John 3.16 was never rescinded. 
Henry Nouwen, he, he writes this, and I think it's really beautiful, so I would invite you to listen carefully. The descending way of Jesus, as painful as it is, is God's most radical attempt to convince us that everything we long for is indeed given to us. And what he asks of us is to have faith in that love. The word faith is often understood as accepting something you can't understand. And people often say such and such can't be explained. You simply have to believe it. However, when Jesus talks about faith, he means this. First of all, to trust unreservedly that you are loved so that you can abandon every false way of obtaining love. Trust that you are loved so that you can abandon every false way of obtaining love. This is what Jesus is telling Nicodemus. And this is what he tells us. And perhaps this morning the Spirit's at work in your heart and and you're feeling convicted and unsure and you want to be reborn and you, you feel like I, I fall short over and over again. I know we say hurtful things. I know we miss the mark. And despite our best intentions, our, our resentments and our complaints, they consistently come to the surface. Jesus is confronting you and I and trying to have us just simply catch hold of the simple truth that you are loved And all the ways you're trying to obtain love in your life are no longer needed. Receive. It is a gift that is freely given. And when you have moments where you're trying really hard, it's not bad to try hard. What I find is that when I try and be my most generous self, I can get caught up in a sense of anger and resentment. Why don't other people, why aren't they trying this right now? Despite my best intentions. When I want to be selfless, selfless, I can be obsessed with wanting to find love. When I find myself questioning others, do they give of themselves like I am in this moment. And just when I think like I'm capable of overcoming temptation, I feel envy towards those who have given into theirs. It almost seems like this virtuous self that I'm pursuing to be is actually just this resentful complainer. And this is our true poverty that I'm totally unable to root out my own resentments. They're so deeply anchored in in myself. And to unroot them almost feels like self-destruction. But this is what we're confronted with, this impossibility of self-redemption. And this this is this moment with Nicodemus and Jesus, where he says, you must be born again You must be born from above. And it's not something that you cannot cause to happen. You can't be born from, reborn from below. That is with my own strength or with my own mind or with my own psychological insights. And I've tried so hard in the past, but the invitation is to receive and to heal. And to begin to receive that life that is meant for us so we can flourish in all that he has, to start anew, to be reborn by his spirit. So the question we're left with this morning is, are you defined by the things that you are trying to obtain love from, or are you defined by the spirit? The arrival of the future has come through Jesus with the spirit now poured out on his people for us to receive. So have you encountered Jesus? The question of John 3 is not just what are you going to do so that you can have something after you die. 
The question of John 3 is what does it mean to be alive? And we have to be courageous this morning. Can we be courageous enough to think of ourselves maybe two categories? One, where we find ourselves far, far from God. Completely broken down by the things of life and in need of a savior. Hear that call of John 3, 16, that God so loved that he gave. Freely. So that you could have eternal life, relationship with God for eternity. Or in the second category, you know, you've heard a lot of good things about him. Perhaps you've made a decision in the past where you're going to take that step in your your journey and you're going to follow him and it feels like it's fallen off. And it's simply become a good idea that you're well aware of. And you're Nicodemus there saying, I've, I've, I call you teacher. I know you do good things. You must be of God. And that is what it has become. And Jesus is inviting you this morning. There's more than just that. It is actually to be born again. To feel the prompting of your spirit. And to hear the voice of God inviting you to receive the love that he has for you. My good intentions, my good works are not good enough. But my good God, who gives love so freely, is always more than enough. Worship team, can you join me at the front? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for stories like what we see in John chapter 3. Nicodemus, the doubter, the defender, the one who felt like his courage came too late. There are so many places for us to find ourselves in this story. We feel like we've maybe missed an opportunity or are fallen short in our relationship or don't even know who you are. Thank you, Jesus, that all of those places that we might find ourselves in this morning are irrelevant to the truth of the promise that is given. I pray that we would be a people that would see Jesus this, this morning. That it wouldn't just be a nice idea, but that our hearts would encounter it. And that we would fall in love with the love that is freely given. Thank you that you meet us as we are, where we're at. All of our quirks and all of the ways that we, that we experience life and encounter relationships. Lead us to know you more. be like you and to, to live like you, but more than anything, to be transformed into your image, to be born again. So Holy Spirit, we just invite you to fall upon our place, upon every heart that's here, that you would meet us where we're at. And this moment is not just an idea of a, a sermon that's spoken or a scripture that's read but it's a moment perhaps that we can reflect upon and, and realize I met God I encountered what love could actually look like in my life thank you for the gift of this moment for our church family for your presence in this place always more than we can ever expect. Give us soft hearts as we go into this week ahead. In Jesus' name I pray.